Good afternoon, and welcome to our um, multimodality imaging conference series, which occurs every Tuesday at noon. I'm Miguel Quinones, and today we're going to uh, talk about the role of stress echo, ischemia evaluation, and beyond. And as we do with all of our conferences, um, you can join us and make comments or text your questions by texting debate key to 37607. And we hope to have a little bit of time at the end to answer any questions that you send us. So stress echocardiography is not a new kid in the block. Actually, it's about 40 years old as a technique since the first description of it. However, still, despite uh, its maturity, uh, there are still challenges that we see in its day-to-day -day application. So today what we'd like to do is first talk a little bit about the assessment of regional wall motion since that is uh, pretty much the key of doing a stress echo. It's still a visual evaluation. Then we're going to talk about stress echo itself, how to, and give you a few tips and then we'll talk a little bit about strain imaging, whether it has any role to be ap applied in stress echo. And finally, we'll end up with just a few non-ischemic uses uh, of stress echo, mention some of them. So as we did on our previous lecture on assessment of left ventricular function, uh, we look at global and regional wall motion. And traditionally, we have um, describe regional wall motion as normal. Hypokinetic, in our own lab, we differentiate mild hypo from more, more moderate or severe hypo. Akinesis, dyskinesia, and frank aneurysm. Uh, this is, of course, a nice normal left ventricle. Here we have a heart that has some abnormalities, and we're going to show them in a minute. Uh, in fact, we're going to see uh, three, at least, of the segmental abnormalities that uh, we're describing. As you can see, in the parasternal long axis view, this inferolateral wall has some hypokinesis compared to a nice normal uh, septum. We can see here probably more close to akinesis, very ab no, no thickening at all. These segments look normal in the fourth chamber, and then in the two chamber, clearly there is even a little bit of maybe dyskinesis, but at least definitely akinesis all the way from the base to the middle segment. So this patient has a, a touch of all of these abnormalities. And a couple of important points to remember. Presence of akinesis or hypokinesis does not imply that there is no viability. Very important. Later on, we'll be discussing that in future conferences. And also, this kinesis is not the same as aneurysm. An aneurysm requires a geometric distortion in diastole, not just the presence of this kinesia. For many years, um, wall motion has been classified uh, with a numerical score, um, and we have used the typical uh, segmentation that corresponds to different coronary uh, distribution, as shown in this beautiful slide from a publication by Dr. Lang. Using color coding, you can see the regions of the left anterior descending, the um, la circumflex, and the right coronary artery, with at, at times, in about 10% of people, having the circumflex being dominant and taking the role of the RCA. We give a value of one to a normal contraction, two to hypokinesis, three to akinesis, four to dyskinesis, and then if there's a frank aneurysm, we use a five. If you all add all these scores and we divide by the 17 segments, then a normal heart would have a score of one. The higher the number, the more abnormalities that a particular heart has. So if we go back to this example, and now we put the numbers, we have some twos for the hypokinetic regions, threes for the dyskinetic, one for the normals, and if we add it all up, we come to a score of 24 divided by 17, or a score index of 1.4. And as I discussed with you in the lecture that we gave on resting function, uh, the higher that score, uh, the worse the potential outcome of patients when followed over five to 10 years. <laughs> 
but we're going to use that also in a rest to stress type of evaluation. So let's get right in into stress echocardiography. And this is a very old slide that is shown to medical students, which is the ischemic cascade. Whenever you have a, a blood vessel that has a significant obstructive lesion, and if you increase the demands of the myocardium, like with a stress test, the first thing that happens is flow heterogeneity. Some regions are going to get better blood flow than the others, and that today we can pick it up with nuclear SPECT and more recently PET, and even with uh, CMR by doing myocardial perfusion. When actual ischemia occurs, then there is regional dysfunction, both systolic and diastolic, but we kind of focus more on the systolic component where you have a reduction in thickening and contraction. And that, of course, can be seen with echo, CMR, but also at times we can also pick it up with SPECT or PET. Eventually, there may be EKG changes, a lot more less sensitive, and angina, which is the actual chest pain. And it's interesting that many patients do a stress test, and they may be very positive, and yet they don't have chest pain during the stress test, even though at home they have chest pain when they do exercise. It's a very interesting uh, observation that uh, we still don't have a perfect explanation for. So uh, this would be a normal stress echo. Um, and notice this is an exercise on a treadmill, so we have a resting and immediately pose. And in all the post uh, views, which are uh, the one to your right here and the one to your right there, you can see a more vigorous contraction, a smaller end systolic cavity, and has some improvement in the ejection fraction. Typically, we talk of a 5% or higher improvement in EF. Now, this is a 62-year-old man with intermittent chest pain for three months. So if this is a resting echo, how would you read it? Well, what's the EF? What do you say the EF is? And do you see any regional wall motion abnormalities? Again, assuming that this were a resting echo. Well, the F is probably close to 50, maybe in the 45 to 50 range, so it's certainly not perfectly normal. It looks like everything is kind of at least mildly hypo. And then where the arrow points, there's even a concern that the apex might be uh, more, more severe hypo or akinetic. So if this were a resting study, would this be somebody who um, has uh, chronic ischemia, hibernation, or maybe we were lucky that we did the echo at the time that the patient was having angina. What is it? Now, reality is that this is not a resting echo. In fact, this is only half of the, sto the story because, in fact, this was the post-exercise component of this patient. So here we see now, at rest, parasternal long axis, short axis, apical four and two chamber, perfectly normal contraction, very good EF, at least uh, 65 or so. And now, with post-stress, we see several very important features. First, notice how the end systolic cavity size is much bigger than here. Now, 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 now. So we have an increasing end systolic cavity size in the parasternal long axis, in the short axis, and in the apical views, both four chamber and two chamber. So that's, that's really bad news. So there's a lot of, uh, of reduction in contraction, in addition to the fact that uh, there is worsening of contraction at the apex. So this type of severe abnormality would make us think of a left main, a multivessel disease, or perhaps just a very dominant LAD that goes all the way around the apex. But clearly, it's a very abnormal finding. So what's the concept behind stress echo? Well, the concept is that we look for ischemia with the stress. And ischemia is usually transient and reversible, OK? However, the degree of dysfunction may last minutes or even hours, depending on the severity of the ischemia at the time, how long it lasted because of the stoning phenomenon. We know that in the dog lab, if we um, occlude an LAD for, let's say, five minutes. It may take a few hours to, to get full recovery. So 
on a stress test, you're trying to get that patient to a point of having ischemia and hopefully sustain the ischemia for a little while. So typically, in a treadmill type of exercise echo, the ischemia may last between 1.5 to 3 minutes after the patient comes back and reclines for the images to be obtained. Occasionally, we even see even up to 5 minutes. Because of this 1.5 range is that one of the key things that uh, we preach is to try to get all the post-exercise images within uh, 1.5 minutes or 90 seconds. So how do we stress people? Well, we exercise them either on a treadmill or a bike. We do pharmacology stressing with a catecholamine, dobutamine, which is the most favorite stressor, at least in America. Vasodilators like di dipyridamol or even adenosine can induce ischemia, but the sensitivity is less. And when one is using dobutamine, often we put a little adjunct, something that may make the ischemia become even more evident. Atropine by increasing the heart rate and getting up to the 85% or higher, or hand grip. So during the dobutamine, the patient does a little bit of a hand grip maneuver. That can also induce more ischemia for the given heart rate that you are getting with the dobutamine. So look at this. It looks pretty messy. This is reality. This is what a sonographer is dealing with when a patient steps out of a treadmill, lays down, and she or he is trying to capture images. And you can see that's why real life evaluation of stress echo, when we first started back in 1980, was very, very challenging. But today, we're capturing these cycles with a digital technology. And as messy as this look, at the end, now we have four views that we can evaluate. Now, one of the challenges when we're doing the treadmill technique is to try to get four views that are as close as possible to the resting views that we acquired on the patient. And you can see here that this four chamber, although everything looks OK, the LV looks shorter than the two chamber because there is a little bit of foreshortening. But that's one of the issues that we will discuss a little later. But notice that now we have four views that we can clearly look and evaluate and interpret. Uh, whereas in real life, with, if all had been done through a videotape capturing, it would be very, very hard and challenging. So the post treadmill technique uh, is widely used because pretty much everybody in their office have a treadmill. So it's an easy one to do. We use the standard protocols like Bruce, um, and it's very available. But it's the most difficult of all stress echoes. So when we are starting to train a sonographer on stress echo, uh, we start with dobutamine, then bike, and treadmills is your most difficult because, as you saw on that clip, you really are fighting against time. You're trying to get all your image captured within that 90-second window. And, uh, you know, it's, it's patient is breathing, the heart is coming in and out of the picture, and you need some levels of skills to get a good capture of those beats. The other problem with the treadmill is that if the patient did not have sustained ischemia for quite some time, then the ischemia may not last long. And that's, again, why we try so hard to capture everything between 60 to 90 seconds. And also, you only have two stages, rest, post-exercise, nothing in between. And that can be an issue when patients have resting wall motion abnormalities, as we will show you a little later. When you're using the treadmill technique, your best accuracy is when a patient reaches 85% of the maximal predicted heart rate during exercise and when the post-exercise images are obtained within 90 seconds post-exercise. We don't care what the heart rate is 60, 70 seconds after. It could be back down to 100 or 90. It doesn't matter. It's what the patient reached during the exercise. Very important point because sometimes people think it's the heart rate of the, at the time of capturing. No, it's the heart rate that the patient reached during the treadmill peak level of exercise. There's been lots of studies showing the accuracy of the treadmill technique. This is a study that we did uh, back in 1992. That's about 28 years ago, where we had uh, close to, to uh, over almost 200 patients, I believe, 
a large sample size of patients which simultaneously they did, actually we had 289 patients, simultaneously they did stress echo and, and nuclear together, same treadmill, we did the stress echo and injected and later on went to the scanner. At that time it was using thallium and we saw an 88% agreement between the two techniques. And interestingly, when the, this, in the 112 patients that had coronary angiography, the statistics for detecting one vessel disease with 70% or more obstruction or two or three vessel disease were basically identical for both techniques. To no surprise, because there were some discrepancies, sometimes one technique picked up what the other one didn't, if you combine wall motion with perfusion, then you had very high sensitivities in picking up disease. And that's why n nowadays many of the nuclear stress testing techniques, they try to also look at wall motion uh, in the report. Unfortunately, it's a wall motion that happens uh, a long time after the, uh, the exercise. But still, it's the recognizing the importance that if you combine perfusion with wall motion, you should enhance the overall sensitivity. Uh, this is an important slide because it was a meta-analysis done many years ago with over 3,000 patients. And again, very comparable sensitivity between stress echo and nuclear with a specificity that appeared to be a little better for echo than nuclear. Um, this has been variable between studies. So, practical tips, okay? Evaluate the NC study cavity size, both global and regional, okay? Look at this parasternal view here, okay? Now, concentrate in NC study, all right? Now, now, so NC study at rest, NC study post, look at that. Look at how much dilation that, oh, that cavity has on NC study, not only global, but regional, this distal area here is much more dilated compared to rest. Short axis shows the same thing. We go to the apical views, look at the end systolic size of the mid to apical uh, regions of the left ventricle, and look how bigger it became with exercise. So concentrate on global and regional end systolic size. Same thing in the two chamber view. Look at the NC-story cavity size now, 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 versus now, now, now. There's been dilation of the ventricle regionally and globally. So therefore, the NC-story volume, if you were going to do volumes, uh, would have gone up. We use stress echo not only to diagnose ischemia and, and detect CAD, but also for uh, outcomes, for prognosis. And that same group of patients that we did report in 1992 for accuracy were followed for six, seven years. And this publication in 1998 showed that both the exercise nuclear with thallium and the stress echo had identical prediction of event-free survival uh, during a follow-up of five years. Here, the nuclear was using a defect that would be less or greater than 15%. And here, with echo, we were using an exercise wall motion score index that was less or more than 1.4. So using some degree of quantitative techniques, uh, both were identical. Actually, I could show you a slide also just simply saying positive or negative. If the test was normal versus abnormal, that also had very similar curves of prediction of outcome but a stronger prediction was observed if you did a little bit of quantitation for nuclear, if you quantify the defects, and for echo, if you applied the wall motion score. The other advantage that uh, the treadmill technique has is that uh, there's been you know, decades of literature showing the prognostic value of exercise e e e stress with ST changes and duration of exercise. So if you combine the duration of the exercise and the ST changes to the wall motion, then you get even a stronger prediction as shown in this three-dimensional plot of producing, uh, predicting bad outcomes or poor survival of patients over uh, several years. In this case, it was five years. So a risk index um, would be basically a combination of the exercise wall motion score, 
the ST changes, and the amount of time a patient is in the hospital. What about bicycle? Well, bicycle can be, do can be done upright or supine. We personally prefer this recumbent supine bicycle, which is in a special table that can't uh, turn around so that it makes imaging a lot easier. The advantage of the bike is that now we get the resting, low-level stages of exercise and your peak. So we can see the progressive improvement in ventricular function that one would expect on a bicycle. And you can see in this case, this is resting, 25 watts, 50, and then peak exercise. If we compare peak exercise with resting, we might pick up some sort of a subtle change. But if we compare the peak with the lower levels of exercise, then it shows amazing. We can clearly see. Again, look at ensystolic cavity. Now, now, now in this um, 50 watts uh, uh, sample. Now look at it in peak. Now, now, now. So there's been global dilation and there's been regional dilation at end systole compare the end systole of rest. So very, very positive response. And we can now see the progression. If this had happened at 25 watts, then you're even talking even more severe disease. So you can also time it exactly when it occurs, which gives you also some more um, ability to get a sense for the severity of the disease. So evaluate historic cavity size, look at the thickening and wall motion, and look for distortion of geometry. Like in here, you see a little bowing right there that we don't see here. And of course, now, what about hemodynamics? So in this study that we published back in 1999, um, done by Dr. Badrudin, um, we did uh, about 100 patients that had a treadmill and a bike at two subsequent days. And to no surprise, uh, the same patient had a much higher heart rate response with the treadmill than with the bike. But the blood pressure was much higher with the bicycle than with the treadmill. And consequently, the double products were identical. So. If you want to have a good, successful treadmill stress echo, you want peak heart rate max to get to 85% of predicted max or higher. If you want a well done bicycle stress echo that you can rely on, you want the double product to get to 2,200 or more, or 22,000 or more, okay? Um, so basically we have, again, good targets both for the treadmill as well as for the bike. And when we look in these patients that uh, had also coronary angiography, about 100 of them, we can see that the overall sensitivity, one vessel, 70% obstruction or more, or two or three vessel disease, they were very similar between the treadmill and the bicycle with the specificities, again, very similar. The numbers were small, 90% versus 80 appears to be higher, but statistically they were very similar. So the bicycle is a very good option, and actually it, it's a good option to think about in patients that are a little bit more elderly, are scared of the treadmill, and yet they can do some bike. And also you can, as I said, uh, look at the time course of, uh, of contractions through heart exercise. It is easier on sonographers. It's a lot more easier. Sonographers have a little bit more time to, to capture their images. And also, because it's during exercise and you have a little bit more comfort for capturing, you can also do some hemodynamics. So we c you can assess diastolic function, feeling pressures, PA pressures, a patient that have valvular diseases, you can assess the, the gradient in mitral stenosis and, and so on. So the bicycle really provides a very nice way of having a full evaluation of a patient during exercise. What about dobutamine? Well, dobutamine has been, again, around for a long, long time. And um, there are two kind of common protocols. The, the, the protocols that most people are, are using are, are, of course, are infusing 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 mics, uh, mic, uh, micrograms per kilogram per minute. 
And then if the heart rate has not quite reached the level you would like, the 85% max, many laboratories, including us, uh, if there's no contraindication, will give a little bit of atropine to push that heart rate up to the 85%. Now, in terms of capturing and presenting, uh, there are two common um, techniques. One is you do a resting next to a 10 mics, and then to a peak dose, and then a post, which is usually one or two minutes later, versus what we do in our lab, which is we do a resting two low levels, five and 10, and this is because we, we've done a lot of work with viability and we, and, we rea and we discovered that having two levels of low dose help us assess better contractile reserve, and then we use the peak at the end. So we don't have a, a post exercise. Or we could look at it by itself, but we don't have it in the quadrant of four uh, captures uh, loops. So just like everything else that I've told you, the tips are the same. Evaluate the NC story cavity size, cavity size, which should be smaller at peak, both global and regional. Okay? And just like with the bicycle, compare the peak with a low level. Because particularly if you have resting wall motion abnormalities, they might get better with the low level and then worsen again with the peak. So your eye will pick up uh, problems a lot easier if you compare the peak with a low exercise. Look at, across like this. No question about the NC story cavity dilation, both global as well as regional. These lower apical regions, much more dilated here than here. Now, 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 versus now, now. And the same thing for the two chamber view. You see it very nicely here. And again, there's a little bit of distortion of geometry. You can see that this area is kind of bulging a little bit right here because of uh, probably a kinetic uh, response in that particular segment. Same thing. This is a different case. Uh, this one uh, is a little bit more global. Again, look at the NC story cavity here and here, which is 5 and 10 mics, and look at the peak the whole ensystolic ventricle went up, much bigger than here. And you can see it on the short axis also. So what do we see? We see an abnormal response, right? No, it's not. It's not normal. Regional global, it is more global. And, and we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So advantages of the butamine is, again, Multiple images that you can do at rest, during, and then peak. So uh, it allows you to time the ischemia, just like with the bike. It also allows you to pick up the assess viability better, because if you have a normal wall motion at rest, you could see it get better and then get worse. So you have a, and it's a lot easier for sonographers. So dobutamine is the easiest of all to train a sonographer, start with dobutamine. If you have a bike in your lab, then move them to bike and allow treadmill to be kind of the last one because by then they have acquired a lot more skills and then they can go ahead and get into the post-exercise. However, the vitamin tends to be a little less sensitive, particularly when you don't get that 85% maximal response in heart rate and it's really bad in concentric LVH. So hypertensive that has small cavities with LVH the sensitivity of your dobutamine really goes down and it's not probably a good test to use. If you have those kind of patients, always go for exercise and if they cannot exercise, I would recommend going to have a nuclear technique. You do get a lot more arrhythmias, PVCs, SVTs, about a 1% HL fib. Um, you get no data on exercise capacity, so you get no functional data in that way. And the EKG is usually worthless. Rarely do you get ST changes with dobutamine. If you get them, they usually are quite positive. So summarizing, no matter which technique do we use, um, we detect ischemia usually because we look at EF. And most of the time, there's a drop in EF. It's more specific, less sensitive, perhaps. A flat response can be seen, but is although more sensitive, less specific. So if you have an EF that is in the, let's say, low 60s, and it stays in the low 60s, and the patient exercise well, you always have a little bit of a discomfort in the report, because it's a flat EF response. It could mean 
multivessel disease and whatnot. It could also mean cardiomyopathy, but it's less specific. So um, in our own experience, we don't use a flat response too much. We kind of like to see some of the other things. We like to see that there is a global or regional ancestry cavity enlargement, which usually goes along with a fall in EF, and new regional world motion abnormalities that you can pick up. Now, what about uh, a drop in EF that is global? Like a couple of cases I've shown you, okay? Is it coronary disease? If it is, then usually it means a left main or severe multivessel disease. If you have a global drop in EF and global dilation of the cavity, but it could also be a cardiomyopathy, okay? So let's look at this case. 45-year-old lady, okay? So here we have the parastenal views. At rest, EF is not gaining a lot of prices, maybe in the low 50s. You can see the short axis here. But clearly, it worsens with post-exercise. And systolic cavity globally is bigger. Versus here. Let me see if I can catch it. There. So the ancestry cavity is bigger, also in the short axis view, and in the epica. So this is your fourth chamber, and you can see bigger cavity here, lower EF, and the two chamber is very impressive too. You can see the ancestry cavity here in the resting nicely, and now I'm trying to capture it. Always bigger. So this is a global response. Now let's look at what happened to the patient. The patient only spent three minutes on the treadmill and became short of breath. However, heart rate went from 79 at rest to 176 in those three minutes, 101 on predicted massicle. Blood pressure from 138 went to 153, which is a normal response, and the double product was pretty impressive. So, so what's the story here? Well, because of that, she had a coronary CT angiogram. It was totally normal. This was a 45-year-old with a large B-cell lymphoma that had been treated with a whole complex uh, of uh, protocols, but included adriamycin exposure. And she was complaining of showing of breath was her main symptom. Um, subsequently, had been treated with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and has had some nice clinical response to them. But this is a nice example of a global response to the stress echo because of a cardiomyopathy, not because of severe disease. So what do the experts say about the appropriateness for op doing a stress echo? Well, the short answer is very similar to what they also say for nuclear. In essence, except for somebody that has a low pretest probability and also has a perfectly normal EKG and can exercise, that one got a score of three. Pretty much all the other scenarios are getting scores of sevens and eights, okay? So, and this is very similar to what uh, is being, uh, was done for the nuclear technology, the techniques. All kinds of stress echoes, no matter what modality, they have the limitations of relying on a subjective assessment of regional wall motion. Therefore, you need high sonographer skills because they need to do a little bit of interpretation of the image as they're capturing it and storing, it, storing the images. And of course, the interpretation of the physician also has to have some level of skills in, uh, in doing it. So you see variations in accuracy between experienced and non-experienced centers. And that still is a problem. Uh, we say, you know, when you, you have practices of physicians in their offices, uh, they may have less uh, skills doing it. Uh, you, we see a tendency for more false positives than the, than we would like to see. Interestingly, nuclear techniques have a little bit of that same problem, uh, particularly when quantitative techniques are not used. When they, it's just sort of an eyeball assessment of the perfusion, uh, you often end up also with uh, false positive defects. So both techniques you know, have their issues when, when done in a more of an office environment by physicians that perhaps have not had as much training as others uh, you would like to have. Now, when you're ordering the test, what should you choose? Well, if the person can exercise, that should always, always be preferred because you get a better quality test and also you get functional assessment of exercise, EKG, exercise duration, and so on. Uh, 
Back is preferred when there is resting or motion abnormalities. It's also a good technique in general, and it's a nice technique for people who are a little scared of the treadmill, more elderly people and whatnot. But importantly, you can see the gradual improvement followed by the worsening when you have a uh, abnormal wall motion at rest. Dobutamine should be deferred for people who cannot exercise at all. Some of the post-MI risk assessment studies were done with dobutamine as well as some of the pre-op risk assessment um, studies were done with dobutamine and more than with exercise. And that's a reason why we put them on the slide. But I think the most important use of dobutamine today it's viability. It's when you have people that have LV dysfunction, one motion abnormalities, and you want to assess for viability uh, because you can then look for the gradual improvement and worsening at the peak levels. And uh, this will be discussed uh, at another time. What's the value of contrast? Well, I showed you several pictures with contrast, so I guess the answer is we believe in contrast. It's probably valuable. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a study from a, this is a patient that participated in a study that I will share with you in a minute. But this is the dobutamine stress echo without contrast. And I would say, okay, what would you say there? And uh, many of you might scratch your head and say, oh, shoot, I'm not sure. Uh, this is your peak e dobutamine. This is your low level. Well, yeah, this area here, I think, has a little bit of regional dilation now, now compared to here, where it really squeezed down nicely. So I would be concerned with maybe an LAD problem here. But I mean, you're kind of like, you know, going through it and scratching your head. And then look what happened with the, when the contrast is put in. The lights were turned on. It's like an angiogram, right? And you saw this case earlier uh, when I was talking to you about the tips to use. But now there is no doubt. This whole EF has dropped. The cavity is bigger than in systole. And regional dilation is very prominent in the LAD territory. So this is very positive. Clearly, it took a microsecond to look at that and say, whoop, that's abnormal. Where without the contrast, we're sort of looking at it and spending more time and scratching our head a little bit. So this trial that was done, again, in 108 patients, they all had coronary angiography, uh, actually has been put in the guidelines of uh, stress echo because uh, it's a trial that showed very nicely that if you have a good quality resting study where all segments are visualized or even one or two are not visualized but all the others are, the contrast gives you very little value. So, you know, save your money. Don't spend that 100 plus dollars in popping an ampule of contrast. But if you have more than two segments at rest that you struggle with, that's where the money is in terms of the contrast improving the accuracy of the technique. And um, because of the results of the study, I think the current guidelines for use of contrast uh, uses that, uh, this type of uh, recommendations. So let's go through a few examples, okay? So what do you all think? This is a dobutamine. 5 and 10, and then pick uh, those. It's a pre-op evaluation. That's why the patient had a dobutamine. So some of you might be seeing this area here and saying, whoops, there's a problem there. That looks like it's not coming, not thickening as well. So is this a small distal septal apical abnormality, patient had normal coronaries. It was read as abnormal, patient had a cath and he had normal coronaries. And then we sat down and looked at it in more detail. And if you go look at it in more detail, what, and I'm going to see if I can catch it, what we see here is that the abnormality is not at in systole, it's in early diastole. See, this, uh, you go, that's end systole. At end systole, everything is coming in nicely. But in early diastole, this relaxes ahead of the other segments. And that's called incoordinate relaxation. And that's, it's an interesting observation that we see at times where the distal segments, more commonly in the septum, tend to relax a little faster than the rest of the heart. So you get this change that if you don't go uh, slowly, if you don't go frame by frame, 
or, um, or play it slowly, you may not catch it. But now, 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 it's really a diastolic abnormality. It has no significance for ischemia. It's just a curiosity. And it's interesting that in the two-chamber view, we don't see it. So had this been a distal LAD lesion, you would have expected to have seen something in that distal anterior wall and, and apex. So beware of that. It occurs periodically, and it can be a, a source of a false positive um, a change. This is an example of a resting a pre and post exercise on a treadmill to talk about the segment that gives us the biggest headache, the segment that sometimes we scratch our head the most, and that's the base of the inferior wall. Because even at rest, that base of the inferior wall, it's um, not as vigorous as the rest of the other segments. So what about this? Is this positive or not? Is this a positive or not a positive? Well, look at rest. At rest, you have very nice gradual thickening of that segment all the way from diastole to systole. When you see it here, notice that this is not thickening at all. And when it thickens, now, 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 notice that the mitral valve is about to open. There, there, there. So this is what is called post-systolic thickening. This is very abnormal and very predictive of ischemia. In fact, if you're in the dog lag and you ligate the coronary artery, the very first response that you see within seconds before the whole segment goes away is post-systolic thickening. Now, if you keep the uh, obstruction for long enough, then it, it will go from post-systolic thickening to just full echinesis, whether it doesn't do anything. And the explanation is that you have ischemia, you have, uh, during systole, you have uh, inability to thicken because of the ischemia, but as the LV pressure is dropping during relaxation, then that segment gets a break. The stress this in that segment drops as the LV pressure is dropping, and the segment then pops out and thickens a little bit, post-systolic thickening. So if you pay attention again and do a little bit of frame-by-frame -frame assessment, you can not um, pick that up, and this patient did have uh, an RCA lesion. What about this one? This is another dobutamine. And uh, do you see any abnormalities here? So again, uh, look at the low doses. Everything looks great. Look at the N-systolic cavity size. There, there, there. And now watch it here. There, there, there. And hopefully you're picking up that this area here has a little bit of geometric distortion, and also there is an end systolic dilation right of, at that, of that uh, diameter right here. And this is a very, and notice that in the two chamber view, everything looks pretty good. So this is a very typical response of a obtuse marginal. Circumflex is the toughest lesion to pick up. LAD is the most easy. Followed by RCA, CERC is a little bit tougher, particularly diag big diagonals or obtuse marginals. Now, this is an interesting case because it points out a point that we have discussed in other lectures. This is a 45 year old lady, year old lady with chest pain, and you can see that there is a nice ST drop with peak exercise. So, the stress ECG is positive, the stress echo is completely normal, nice and normal. You can see the N-systolic cavity much smaller here, okay? And uh, this is basically an example of why we tend to recommend uh, stress echoes more in women because there is a higher tendency for false positives uh, ECGs. All right, so we talked about strain in the past, in the last time when we discussed global function. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it because by now you, many of you are familiar with it. The question is, can we use it for regional wall motion and, st and uh, stress uh, testing? So this is a patient that has a very nice uh, kinetic uh, inferior wall at the base, and the strain picks it up very nicely. The bullseye shows very nicely this area is way, way abnormal compared to the rest. Patient with an apical abnormality that we can all see, Likewise, has uh, an area here 
of much lower um, longitudinal strain compared to the other parts of the ventricle. And these are the typical bullseyes that uh, are shown. This is from, from a publication by Perk, where normal would be all red. And this is typical LADs, depending, of course, whether it's a proxima. In this case, it would be a proxima LAD. So you have a lot of anterior wall septal territory here compared to the one I just showed you, where it's mostly distal apical. This is a, an RCA or dominant circ, and this would be a typical circ. So these are using bullseyes, uh, the regions that tend to correspond to the coronary vessels. So several small studies were done. This was one of the early ones that done with 100 patients, showing that um, uh, failure to improve the longitudinal strain uh, uh, beyond 20 uh, had a sensitivity of 84%, specificity of 87%, and uh, longitudinal strain was superior to radial. So smaller studies came out. Uh, this is an interesting one where they actually compared visual with uh, strain. So here you can see visually this patient has an LAD abnormality. Resting is normal, and here you can see the distal ventricle uh, abnormal, typical of LAD. So what they did is that they had uh, the experts being faculty versus fellows to compare with, and um, the bottom line was that it was not a perfect story for <laughs> neither one of them. but. Strain imaging in general had a better sensitivity. Here we have a sensitivity in the 80% range versus 70s and 60s uh, for the visual assessment. Specificities was a little bit of a different story. And then this is a more recent publication from last year by Gupta where they did a meta-analysis. So they review all kinds of studies where they had used uh, strain during stress, uh, close to 1,000, 178 patients, 13 studies, 10 of them use invasive coronary angiography as the reference. And they did something called a pooled area under the curve for uh, detecting CAD. And the, if using that technique, the pool AUC for strain was 92% versus 83% for visual. Here are the confidence intervals. The sensitivity w for strain was 88% versus 74% for visual, and the specificity was 80% for strain and 83% for visual. So in this meta-analysis, specificities were comparable, but in general, sensitivities were higher with strain. And here is what the, 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 ROC, the RUC curves here. Each of these points, whoops, each of these points is one of the studies. And this is what they call the summary operating point of combining all these studies. And this is for specificity. Uh, and I'm sorry, this is um, the, the two separate ones that were done. So um, looks very encouraging. However, when you get down to day-to-day -day use, particularly in places like uh, Texas, where we have a lot of big folks with uh, difficult imaging, there are some real limitations because you can really use it mostly with dobutamine. It's very hard to do strain when somebody comes out of a treadmill and even with a bike. If you have an absolutely super easy, beautiful imaging patient, yeah, you might be able to do it in a bike. So the accuracy is limited by the image quality. And biggest problem is that you cannot use contrast. So um, therefore, it hasn't really reached prime time in terms of day-to-day -day use in most laboratory, even though, as you saw, there's already a meta-analysis with a fairly good size sample size. But the point is, all of those patients in those trials had to have pretty good quality images, and most of them were done with dobutamine. So what about other uses? Well, uh, I showed you a little bit about that cardiomyopathic response. So actually, there is a study, there's been more than one, but this is an, an, an interest, one of the first studies that showed that if you have somebody with a cardiomyopathy stable, this is not somebody who's in, in, in decompensated heart failure. The patient that came in with a viral cardiomyopathy or postpartum cardiomyopathy or alcoholic cardiomyopathy, you have treated the patient, patient is now in at least class two, fairly compensated. If you do a dobutamine and the patient has an improvement in EF with the dobutamine, Chances are that six months later, they will sustain an improved EF. In contrast, if they fail to get a contractile response to dobutamine, chances are they won't 
And it's interesting because um, in the CMR literature, there is somewhat similar findings. So um, this is kind of a nice little trick you could do if you have a patient that uh, you're treating for a postpartum, it's now three months since the acute event, they're doing well, but you're still getting an EF of 34%. You give a little butamine and they get up to 50 you can talk to them and say, you know, the response of your test really is encouraging that your heart function is going to improve within the next six months to a year. So it's kind of a nice little thing to, to have uh, that you can use. Other non-ischemic uses, it's a big one, is myocardial viability. And this is going to be covered by Dr. Zavi in our next multimodality imaging uh, conference in January 5. We're going to have a little break for Christmas. Um, Likewise, in the assessment of diastolic function uh, and looking for changes in feeling pressures with stress, uh, there is a diastolic stress test that Dr. Naga hopefully will discuss in, in his talk in January 12th. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, the ability to do hemodynamic assessment, either treadmill or bike, uh, mitral stenosis, look at the change in gradient with exercise and pulmonary pressures using the TR jet. You can use a little contrast to enhance the TR looking at pulmonary hypertension patients to see how much uh, their uh, response uh, with pulmonary pressures. We know well aortic stenosis, the use of the butamine to evaluate the increasing gradient and sometimes may help us decide in people that have low gradients and body F as to whether they might respond to valve replacement. So these are some of the non-ischemic uses uh, for stress echo that have been very well established and certainly any laboratory that has a lot of experience with stress echo uses this, uh, the technique for this other type of uh, conditions. So I thank you very much for your attention and we have left a little time for questions. So at this point we'll check and see if we have any questions in the board to address. So we get one. What is the prognostic value of VT during the vitamin stress echo in the absence of wall motion and normalities on the scan? Ah, that's a good question. The answer is, in general, um, not very good. Now, again, all VTs are not created equal. So if you're giving the butamine, as, you, as I said earlier, there's about a 1% incidence of AFib. If you give what you tell me, you get a lot of PVCs and you get a 4-bit VT, you get, uh, you know, a ventricular tachycardia at a rate of 150, um, last six, seven, eight, nine seconds, and it converts back. Um, it's not that helpful because people can do that, particularly people that have other comorbidities, hypertension and so on. Now, if somebody has you know, the bad VT, where they go into very fast VT, you may have to cardiovert them. They, you know, obviously that's a whole different situation. And I think most people would uh, take that as an abnormal response and, and do something else with that patient, you know, heart catheterization, to put the, uh, do some electrical assessment and whatnot. Um, it's different from exercise. If somebody has a sustained VTAC or things like that with exercise, there's a whole uh, wells of literature showing that in many of these patients do have problems uh, as when they're followed. So um, the butamine is a little bit tougher because it, it's so arismogenic by itself that uh, uh, you may end up having it in a patient, particularly if it's just a short burst that uh, spontaneously converts. We have any other questions? Uh, Okay, so if we don't have any more questions, I thank you all for your attention. And uh, again, we're taking a break for Christmas, and we'll see you back in the uh, January 5th. Uh, that would be a, a session on viability that would include both the echo and other techniques such as CMR and so on. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.